Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being at the Public Safety Committee meeting. Um, today, we have two, two topics, both of which are briefings, and there's no vote expected on either one. This is all information. The first one will be about telehealth, uh, telehealth and the alternate destination program from Fire and Rescue Service. And the second one will be a briefing on the police department staffing. And with that, I'm going to turn to Susan Frog, who did both, who did both packets on this, and as always, did a marvelous job. And uh, I'm going to turn to her and ask her to begin, please. Good morning, everybody. Um, the first one up, as you noted, is from the fire department. You have lots of chiefs here today, including Chief Goldstein, who I did not list in the packet, and I apologize. Um, the department has a PowerPoint that either I can run or Chief Bush can run um, that's dealing with the two different programs that they've implemented, the alternate destination transport program and a new telehealth program. So I'm, I'm turning it over to fire and I'm happy to run this PowerPoint if you like, or you should also have share capability. Very good. And Chief Goldstein, even though you weren't listening in the packet, we recognize you. We know who you <laughs> are, so and, not and, a problem. And welcome to all the other chiefs. Yeah. And there is no doubt that the information that Alan and Ben, who are the, 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 the two powerhouses in EMIHS, are going to talk about today are a continued example of how Montgomery County, as, as a conglomerate and fire rescue, are addressing different community needs, addressing different ways or finding different ways to address the need of our patients and our customers and ways that assist the, the health network by getting the people the right care at the right time. And, and we've uh, flexed based upon COVID and, and all the things that we've learned through or adaptations that, because part of our alternative destinations started before the pandemic started and got impacted by, by part of the pandemic. And very timely, yours today, the, the same team of Alan, Ben, uh, Avatar, and myself had a sit down face to face meeting with uh, Rolando Santiago as HHS and, and his new position in, in mental health, behavioral health as part of HHS's uh, role in supporting, supporting the greater community's uh, involvement in, in addressing the, this crisis. So this is a great partnership between a lot of county agencies and um, Alan and Ben will, will pick it up from here, but thank you, uh, Pre President Hucker, uh, Council Member Katz and Abernaz and Susan for, for this opportunity. Thank you. Which chief is leading this off, please? Yeah, so good morning. Uh, good it's morning. a pleasure to be here and to be able to address you uh, folks again. Uh, with me today is uh, Battalion Chief Ben Kaufman, uh, who I think this is his inaugural address to the Public Safety <laughs> Committee, but wow. I'm sure he will uh, uh, be uh, very impressive in his own right. So, um, Susan, if, if it's okay, I'm going to ask Ben to go ahead and present. So, Ben, if you're able to share your screen. If, if not, I guess oh, there, there it is. Very good. Uh, so, Ben and I are going to tag team this presentation, and, and we want to just brief you uh, this morning about uh, our alternative transport destination program and our telehealth program. Uh, so both of these programs are uh, uh, part of a wider nationwide uh, program that's being developed by the uh, Medicare administration. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about ET3, which is an abbreviation for the emergency triage treatment and transportation program that uh, Medicare put into place. Uh, but to understand why they are, are interested in this, uh, we kind of have to have a little bit of a historical perspective. So uh, on the screen is kind of our traditional EMS model uh, for the last uh, several decades. Uh, so someone calls 911 uh, in uh, Montgomery County nowadays, uh, if it's a, a, a low severity or a low acuity complaint, uh, they'll get an ambulance uh, that uh, drives to the scene uh, and without lights and sirens. 
uh, or if it's a more serious complaint, such as a heart attack or a stroke, uh, they're going to get an immediate red lights and sirens, paramedics coming on the fire engine and the chase car, uh, and an ambulance. Uh, but the end result is the same. They're all going to go to uh, a hospital-based emergency department. Uh, next slide. So uh, what Medicare did was they crunched a whole lot of numbers uh, from retrospective billing data, and they said that uh, based on those outcomes, they estimated that 17% of those patients uh, probably could have been successfully treated in a primary or urgent care setting. Um, so we had come to uh, much the same conclusion, although our numbers were a little bit more conservative. We thought uh, maybe 10% uh, was, was probably about right, just given our patient population and, and what our experience was. Uh, but we also uh, believe that, uh, as Chief Goldstein said, uh, there, there were probably more efficient and more effective ways to treat some of these patients uh, to get them the right care at the right time in the right place. Uh, but Medicare, as you know, is the, the 800 pound gorilla when it comes to setting fiscal policy for health care. And uh, when they came out with this, uh, this, uh, this model and this pilot, it certainly caught attention from a lot of the stakeholders. So we were successful in applying for the ET3 program as a pilot project. Uh, we are actually one of uh, three jurisdictions in Maryland that was accepted. And as of today, we're the only one that's up, up live and running. So, and I would be remiss if I didn't recognize uh, Battalion Chief Kaufman and his efforts to get, get this program up and started. Uh, he was certainly uh, the spark plug that got us going. Uh, so next slide, please. So why are we interested in it overall? Uh, because low acuity calls certainly are a large part of our, our EMS workload. Um, historically, about 60% uh, of our dispatches are, are low acuity. Um, and as you know, and, and from previous uh, appearances, uh, we have a mobile integrated health program uh, that, that uh, the council was very generous in funding a couple of years ago. Uh, in our efforts to deal with uh, our super users, uh, those folks that call 911 on a very frequent basis. Uh, we see this as kind of a logical expansion to that. Uh, we do have uh, a lot of less frequent low acuity callers, but uh, folks who still need help in, in navigating to the right care. Uh, so that's why we were interested in the ET3 program. Uh, next slide. So, how does this fit in with our overall vision of where we see EMS going? Um, we want to be able to offer uh, low acuity care options to those patients who need it. Um, and certainly, as you know, we've been active in the mobile integrated health field with uh, referring frequent users uh, to other uh, community resources that are more appropriate to their uh, long-term needs. Uh, we've been uh, very cooperative and collaborative with Health and Human Services with the Opi Opiate Intervention Task Force. And uh, we're still continuing that partnership today. And uh, although COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic has certainly uh, greatly curtailed our home visit program for dealing with some of our super users, uh, we still have it. And uh, once we emerge from this pandemic, we uh, certainly plan to continue that. Uh, so I, I'd like to kind of turn now to the nuts and bolts of uh, telehealth and, and uh, ATD, and, and so I'll turn it over to Ben. So next slide. Okay, thanks. Uh, so this is very much Chief Bush's baby. He's been dealing with this for many and many years in the preparatory phases, and I just uh, kind of operationalized this towards the end of last year. We we kicked this off on on January first. So. Uh, the traditional model is still in play, whereas people obtain services from us by calling 911. So they're going to get a response through that process. So what we've done is trained our personnel that are responding on calls to uh, determine patient eligibility, whether they're eligible to be transported to an alternative destination or they're eligible for a telehealth visit with a physician right there at their at their home or at the scene. So uh, if they are eligible for alternative destination, we contact the urgent care by phone. 
uh, and have the have the urgent care physician that we're speaking with accept the patient. And then we also obtain consent from the patient themselves. And then if they're a telehealth option, we uh, obtain consent from the patient and we we make a phone call from our ruggedized smartphone to uh, the unified number that is our uh, the physician's group that we're working with. And the on-call physician answers the phone and we just identify ourselves and say we're we're ready to do a telehealth call and the physician initiates a Zoom call back to the crew uh, so then they have a secure video conference with the patient. Uh, so the patient and the physician then are interacting with one another and we are there to support not only the technology of the phone call but also patient assessment findings and and assist with the uh, assist with patient care and uh, our, in terms of our uh, the billing practice, all of all of that is running as normal, and we obviously would would document the scene, uh, document the patient care experience as we would anything else. So we kicked this off at the first of the year, and to date, uh, combined, we've had 28 uh, uses, kind of split down the middle. Uh, telehealth calls have been 15, and half and half uh, whether they work or not. And work is in quotes because uh, eight have resulted in patient transport, and a lot of times we'll call and speak with the physician and the physician recommends uh, a result other than staying at home. So whether it's uh, you need to be transported to the hospital now or transported to an urgent care, the patient ends up still being transported. And then seven of those calls resulted in the patient actually remaining at home. Uh, one later on, it was probably an hour or two after the telehealth call, called back 911 a second time and needed to be uh, transported to the hospital. And we always, if we're ever leaving a patient at home through a refusal or a, or uh, the physician guided uh, remain in place. We always give them the option that they can call back 911 later, and sometimes people certainly do that. And then for alternative destinations, we've had nine transports, and about half of them have required a secondary transport to the emergency room, which was to be expected that uh, we don't always get it right, or the urgent care can't always care for the patient to the fullest extent that we want them to, uh, even if we expect that that is going to happen. Sometimes people uh, end up in the emergency department. And then there's been a couple other times where it hasn't worked. I know of two cases that uh, we called the urgent care and they said, no, you have to go to the emergency room. So I just, and I'm sure it's more than that, but I happen to know of those two. Uh, and then last week we had an ambulance transport to uh, an alternative destination that's not participating. So we have partnered with uh, Kaiser and Adventist Urgent Care but we had a pilot program for this uh, back in the early calendar year 20, end of 19 and calendar year 20. And our original partner was, uh, was right time. So I think the, the, this particular crew knew of right time that was uh, you know, part of our original plan, but they're no longer participating with us. Uh, it worked out fine. We have a relationship with right time. They're just not uh, part of the plan right now and um, the patient ended up uh, being treated successfully there. And then one other time where it was uh, a clinician in the field reported that the physician didn't pick up the telehealth line, we just couldn't duplicate that. So we're, we're still working out some bugs. Uh, overall, I think those numbers represent that we're off to a slow start and <clears throat> a couple of reasons why that might be uh, clinician awareness. So we acknowledged that we were gonna do a soft launch here, that we the training was not mandated, mandated by the start date. Uh, so that was calculated. We have worked the training into our annual recertification process, which is ongoing now, although we do have several hundred people who've already completed the training. Uh, and that's, uh, that is uh, certainly a factor in, in why not everybody is aware of it right now, but it's, we're doing pretty well with that. And our call volume is down. Um, it, it was down very uh, significantly back in the middle, early to early to middle part of last year due to COVID. We're getting back closer to baseline, but we're still down anywhere between seven and 10%. And of the people who are still calling 911 for our services, the acuity has been a bit higher. So I think people are generally trying to avoid transport to the hospital uh, because of fears of COVID. But I think that that's coming back a little bit more closer to, uh, to baseline, but we, we definitely saw a dramatic drop off uh, many months ago. Uh, we put a podcast together where I spoke with one of the physicians who's kind of been the lead of the telehealth portion. So we pushed that out to the department. Um, uh, we had in the last week or so an uptick in 
in slip, trip, and falls uh, due to the weather. And that actually increased our patient eligibility for people who were calling with uh, minor orthopedic injuries or lacerations that end up, uh, those patients are eligible for our alternative destinations so that uh, we, we were able to uh, grab a, an increase of patients that end, ended up going there and that worked out. Uh, we have EMS 700, which is an EMS supervisor uh, that's in place specifically to help with our COVID uh, increase. So we've had, uh, you're all aware that uh, the hospitalizations went up significantly through the second surge and it got to the point that it was impacting the hospital's ability to admit patients out of the emergency room, which was backing us up. So we we put EMS 700 in place to help distribute patients more evenly and get the right patient to the right hospital with the resources able to care for them at, at the right time. So we had, we're, we're, and this is still in place today, we're getting constant information from the hospitals about their capabilities, uh, mostly with ICU bed availability, but also with how busy the emergency department is and how many patients may be boarding, meaning they're, they need to be admitted, but they're still in the, inside the emergency department taking up a bed. So we'll try to avoid those hospitals or, or uh, you know, move to a hospital that has better capabilities at the time. And having that supervisor in place is allowing us to more readily ad identify patients who are eligible to go to an alternative destination, direct them there. Um, so that, that has certainly been a help and uh, something we'd like to keep. Uh, obviously, public, public education is going to be a part of that. Oh, it was uh, discussed whether we should push out uh, a press release very early on, but we wanted to work out the bugs that we have over the last six or seven weeks or so and obviously speak with you. And we'll be at a point that we can we can release this to the public now. I'm pretty comfortable with how it's going. Um, <clears throat> but we've identified really that a, a, a lot of the lower acuity patients who are uh, calling for our services are just not eligible for transport to the traditional urgent care model. Uh, because of uh, substance abuse or behavioral health needs. And I, really those patients are taking up uh, a big chunk of our emergency department beds right now. So our greatest need as a system would be for, having, for us to have a place to transport patients, whether it's a recovery center uh, or restoration center or some, some behavioral health component. It's really important for us. And back to you, Chief Bush. Yeah, so moving forward, uh, where do we see this going? Um, so we, we want to see what the data shows us about the success of the uh, alternative destinations and the telemedicine. As part of the ET3 program, uh, they are also willing to fund uh, mobile urgent care, whether it's uh, an advanced practitioner such as a, um, a nurse practitioner or a PA. Uh, there's also a potential grant program for a nurse triage line at, uh, at ECC. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so the nurse triage line, we anticipate that, that Medicare will uh, issue what they call a NOFA uh, in early spring. Uh, so this is essentially a, a grant application process, but it's only available to ET3 participants such as ourselves. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know what the terms and conditions of that will be yet, and the devil's always in the details. Uh, but what uh, CMMI is advising us is that this will fund startup costs for implementation, uh, but that, that covers a lot of ground. So unfortunately, there's a lot of unknown details at this point, but uh, there are uh, cities such as Las Vegas, um, that have instituted this, this enhancement to their communication centers and have had some success in uh, not having to send 911 resources uh, to the scene at all. Um, so I do want to, to recognize uh, the, the achievement of our uh, emergency communication center, particularly uh, uh, now that it's under police management. Uh, one of the first accomplishments that they did was to get accredited by the uh, International Academy on Emergency Dispatch. And that was an essential step uh, if we were to institute a nurse triage line. Uh, we would not be able to do that without them being accredited. So I uh, just want to publicly say uh, kudos to them for achieving that. Um, next slide. So as uh, just want to leave you with this, this last slide, uh, so moving forward, 
uh, we always want to be able to offer the, the outstanding care that we always provide for those patients with uh, time-dependent uh, severe acuity emergencies, uh, again, heart attacks, strokes, cardiac arrest. Uh, that's why we're here, and, and uh, we want to guarantee a speedy response and outstanding clinical care for those folks. Uh, but we also want to recognize that uh, there's a lot of other folks <clears throat> with less serious and less time-dependent uh, urgencies, but that are still deserving of appropriate care. Uh, and we want to be able to build that out so where we have a menu of options. And as uh, Ben indicated, one of the things that we're really seeing uh, over and over is the uh, profound effect that substance abuse and behavioral health emergencies are having on our, our residents. And uh, just the opportunity to take them to, to someplace better than a hospital-based emergency department where they could receive uh, more appropriate care would certainly be useful. And I, and I know you're going to hear more about this when it comes uh, to uh, reimagining public safety and, and again, in a, in a couple of weeks when uh, OLO delivers their report on behavioral health. But uh, I, I would be failing failing you if I didn't mention it in this venue. So uh, with that, uh, thank you for your time and attention. And uh, Ben and I are more than happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very, very much for uh, for the presentation. It's very interesting and, and really uh, seems like this is the, the, the right steps for us to be taking. Um, what are the costs, if any, that are associated with administering the two programs? Uh, so there was considerable staff time, as you might imagine, in setting up all the legal agreements, et cetera, uh, working with the state to set up the protocols. Uh, other than that, most of the costs are indirect. Uh, so there is the cost of the, the ruggedized phones on the units. Uh, we had already invested in that due to a need for uh, backup communications capability that those phones provide, but uh, it was very handy that, that they were there. Uh, the, other, uh, the other possible cost is there, uh, so this is a Medicare program. The ET3 program is a Medicare program. Uh, other insurers are, uh, possibly might not pay for the transport. Our billing company is billing, sending a bill to all insurers, uh, but there's nothing to compel other insurers to pay that bill. Um, so that, that's the only cost that, that, that I'm aware of. And, and if the insurance company does not pay for the patient, the patient does not pay. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, and, and we have to always be clear on that. I mean, because I know people get get uh, concerned. Right. And on the point about the the uh, cell phones, is it the same ones that you have used or have bought for the uh, uh, backup measure for the public safety uh, radio system? That's correct. And are are they being funded? moving forward in the FY22 operating budget? Uh, I believe that that's still under consideration at this at this time. Chief uh, Goldstein, I, I'm saying oh. Chief, and everybody seems to answer here today. Yeah, Chief so Goldstein, I, yeah. I see, I see uh, Rachel and I uh, camera back on. So, yes, OMB and the, and the department are working together, and that is a, a request to for continuation in F22 as as the the phone's role is is expanding and the video uh teleconference or the video conference capability has has uh become so important in the the telehealth role so it is the intent of both uh, omb and frs to to continue that if capability within the operating budget exists yeah i, I would just emphasize that it is being considered through the 22 budget development process but at this point you know that's still um so work in progress well, and I, i'm speaking for myself but i have a feeling i'm speaking for the other committee members uh i know that ms farag will certainly make note of this and we i certainly am supportive that we continue this funding i mean obviously in order to do your job you have to have the the proper equipment and then the other question that, that's on our in our packet, it, have you seen any changes in utilization now that some of our county residents have actually received the, vac the uh, vaccination? 
Yeah, I'll defer to, to Ben to fully answer the question. I would say probably not at this point that uh, these trends take some time to develop. But uh, Ben, have you seen anything from your perspective? No, no, I, I, yeah, I don't really have anything to, to say to expand on that. We're, we're very early in the vaccination process and uh, we're not at the point that it's impacting our operations at all. Thank you. And what we what we saw, I mean, obviously we had our May May spike or or the surge number one in the beginning of, um, and then we've all experienced the the November through uh, you know January surge as as the second surge occurred. Um, in a daily view, we're talking about you know about 10% of the patients we're engaging with are are pandemic symptom. Um, so people who have uh, the, the, the symptoms relatable to, to the COVID, that's down from close to 25% in some of our higher uh, components. Um, but the, the, the patient call load, as Alan outlined, overall is still down. People still are, are deferring their, their call to 911 for some greater concerns about the you know, hospitals and healthcare and that that's got uh, a, a negative detriment to you know we're seeing sicker people across the board because they're delaying their their utilization of 911, but the vaccination or the amount of of our community who is who's vaccinated has not changed or seen an impact in our our response. Okay, and if someone is say, told that they could stay at home, but they're by themselves, if there's nobody in that home with them or how and if they need medication how how is any of that working uh for this process so through the telehealth process yes the um so the physician uh, and and the ems crew that, that arrive there are going to make a determination of the patient's capabilities so if the patient is not able to uh i'm sorry let me back up if the if the physician over the phone prescribes a medication they're going to ask uh, what the preferred pharmacy is, call in a prescription there, and the patient would then pick up the prescription the same way they would any other any other prescription. But if it's our assessment the patient doesn't have any way to pick that up, that may lead us to uh, another finding another way to do it, whether it's a transport to the hospital or an urgent care or uh, you know some other arrangements that the the patient can pick up the uh, prescription. I see, and and um. The, the the one question, the one discussion that you had about the, the, that there's a possibility that I guess it was in in California that they don't not don't necessarily send in an ambulance at all that you can do everything through telework. It, could you touch on that again, please? Yes. So that was the nurse triage line. Uh, right. The, the idea, of, and that was occurring in, in Las Vegas. Uh, so close, okay. close to California. But, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, I gambled and I missed, but anyway. <laughs> uh, and actually, uh, DC is doing a modified program, uh, you know, just south of us. I, that that was derelict of me not to mention that. But uh, the idea is that with, when they call 911 uh, as part of the emergency medical dispatch uh, procedures that are in place through IAED, uh, they can divert the call, certain calls to a nurse and the nurse can either give uh, the patient instructions over the phone or the nurse can arrange alternative ways for the patient to get care. Uh, so in DC, they're actually sending uh, taxis and Ubers to pick the patient up, take them to a clinic, uh, receive definitive care that way. Uh, and again, this is low acuity complaints. They're certainly not doing that with heart attacks, et cetera. Right. Uh, I believe the program in Las Vegas is strictly just a nurse triage. Um, she's uh, he or she is simply talking to the patient over the phone, uh, figuring out what's going on with them, and uh, you know either suggesting uh, care through their primary care physician or directing them to a clinic or something like that. Um, so it it uh, I, I wouldn't say that there's a massive number of patients that are diverted that way, uh, but every little bit helps. Thank you. Vice President Albanonis. Uh, thank you. And welcome, Battalion Chief Kaufman. You did a great job for your opening presentation. Just watch out for cats. You'll be fine. Uh, his bite is worse than his bark. 
uh, you'll be good. Uh, just, yeah. just great, great, great job. Um, I am very excited about this program. Uh, this has significant implications, uh, and I, I feel fortunate to be on the Health and Human Services Committee uh, to provide some context for this discussion. We're going to be having later this fall, um, after the dust settles from COVID, a public health summit where we're going to be discussing things like telehealth and the applications and helping to address some of the racial disparities that we've seen just on steroids during COVID. So this is tremendous. Um, and I completely concur uh, with our chair in wanting to continue this investment because the return on investment, I think, is significant on a number of different levels, not just from a dollars and cents perspective, but just an overall quality of care, which I think has major implications. A um, couple of questions. Have we tracked demographically um, you know, were, were the, the 28 or so cases, were they mostly older residents, younger residents? Were they in specific zip codes or areas? Or uh, have you piloted this within specific um, units? Or has, been, has, has this been across the board? Just some initial context questions. Yeah, so the program is rolled out countywide. And with that EMS supervisor that's, that's directing units where to transport, that uh, that's helping us uh, you know, keep the keep it in the mind of the crews aware that, that they have this option. It's been a wide range of patient ages. It is for uh, adults only, so they have to be 18 or older in order to participate in either the alternative destination or telehealth. But a, a wide range of of complaints. Most most of the or the alternative destination transports have been orthopedic injuries uh, or lacerations, something that's uh, and in and out there. You're going to be treated and then referred to to care somewhere else. And, but the telehealth use really, when we think about uh, how that operationalized, we originally was supposed to be for a, a very small subset of patients who were lower acuity and could just stay at home. But the advantage of getting a physician right to the patient's side, uh, you know, it, virtually to be able to, to perform assessments, there's really no limit to that. And we've seen the use of telehealth in cases that we didn't necessarily uh, intend, which was a patient who doesn't want to go to the hospital but doesn't fit the low acuity model there for whatever reason. Uh, they, they don't want to leave their family or they don't want to be in the hospital for COVID. And it, rather than us just leaving the scene with a with a, the patient refusal process, which we have, uh, it's it's really going above and beyond for us to bring a, pa bring a physician right to the patient and be able to at least get their eyes on it. And most often a physician recommendation to actually, you have to go, you know, to say you have to go to the hospital is uh, changing patients' minds and actually getting them the care that they need. I appreciate that. That's really helpful. And I think the, um, and, and in terms of, to again, our chair's point, um, you know, the technology in telehealth is, is growing rapidly uh, and catching up because just in the last nine months, we've made more progress in the last nine months than the last nine years on telehealth. So I think that. Obviously, our baseline is our existing equipment, but as more equipment becomes available in this space, I think it's worth us being proactive and seeking what's out there, um, because I know our clinics in particular are starting to um, look at different telehealth options um, that, that I think could be really helpful. Um, on the technology side, do you find that um, the urgent care centers you've partnered with, do they have uh, an appropriate level of technology on their side, because obviously we're focusing right now, as we should, on the first responder side, but do they have what they need on the back end? So the urgent cares have varying capabilities. We're, we're with Kaiser, so we transport to the Kaiser in Gaithersburg, and they're really an advanced urgent care where they can keep patients for up to just under 24 hours uh, and do all kinds of things, fluid resuscitation, CT scans, yeah, they even can can do a blood transfusion there. So certainly much more than what our uh, our partners at Adventist Urgent Care can do. They're somewhat limited, um, but, and every urgent care is different. So, they, you know, as uh, I think that our, our goal is to get the right patient to the right place, and just knowing those capabilities will, will come with time as people become more familiar with our partners. And uh, we, we still have Right Time, who was recently bought by, uh, by MedStar. They're still in the wings as well. We're still having talks with them which would be a huge help for us because they have uh, 
uh, more uh, centers around the county that would give us uh, better geographical coverage. So we're, we're still interested in, in closing the loop and getting them on board with us. I appreciate that. Two, two final points. One, amen to the comment about needing more locations to send folks who are in mental health crisis with behavioral health needs. Um, you know, there's, there's multiple issues there, though. It's not just a place to send them. The policies in place to actually be able to get them to go and stay there are part of the challenge, too, and that crosses over to the state. So I do very much look forward to the OLO discussion when we talk about behavioral health systemic issues across the board because um, this is just a real-time example of, you know, a challenge that doesn't just burden the family who's in crisis, but our entire system uh, and has a cascading effect that impacts overall public health. So uh, I definitely want to follow up on that after the OLO report. And I want to make sure we use this as an illustration of potential solutions that are out there, but also an example of the challenges. Um, and then my final uh, thought is just a suggestion. Um, and this will obviously warrant further discussion, but as this pilot evolves into, you know, being being something that we count on more consistently, I'd also like for us to explore our health clinics uh, that we partner with in the county that in many instances are uniquely equipped with language access and very significantly culturally trained staff uh, who can help address the unique needs of some of our residents. Um, in our Asian community, uh, some of our health clinics um, do an outstanding job of being able to speak multiple Asian languages, uh, which oftentimes urgent care or emergency rooms are not as well equipped to handle. And so that may help, you know, uh, screen on the front end using telehealth, whether or not somebody needs to go to, you know, the, the, the next level, uh, if, if something rises to that level. And congruently within our Latino community as well, um, we have health clinics such as the Mary Center and others that are uniquely positioned uh, to be able to understand those cultural needs and challenges, which I know you guys do a great job and, and do the best you can um, with whatever situation you've come upon. But that could be another evolution of this. And obviously, we'd need to make sure that they have the capacity in the same way our urgent care folks have the capacity. Um, but it could be an extension of this really exciting pilot. So I want to follow up with you guys on that. Yeah, thank you. I, I really appreciate that comment. And um, actually, our original uh, pilot last year, we, we wanted to include a, um, a clinic uh, for precisely the reasons that you enumerated. Uh, when we worked with the state to set up kind of the enabling protocol for this, uh, they wanted to start with a baseline of capabilities. So that included things like x-rays, suturing, etc. cetera. Um, so, in an effort to get this off the ground, we, we agreed to that, but absolutely as we expand, uh, I think that there's other opportunities there. Um, and as well, I mean, it, it seems like every time we turn around, we're finding another point of intersection uh, between ourselves and health and human services. Uh, so certainly we wouldn't be able to do a lot of things that we're doing with uh, mobile integrated health without HHS. Uh, so I see this as yet another uh, example of how ourselves and public health are intersecting. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Look forward to hearing more about this. So I'm all in, very bullish on this pilot. Uh, Mr. Chairman, back to you. Thank you very much. Let me ask about the Kaiser. If, if someone does not belong to Kaiser, will Kaiser accept them and they, their regular other insurance will pay? How does that work? So our intent is to get uh, patients who are Kaiser members to Kaiser, and if they're not Kaiser members, they would be eligible for one of the other urgent cares. I, I see. Okay. Thank you. President Hopper. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, folks, this is great news. I'm really, I'm equally bullish about it, uh, to steal the vice president's term. Um, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I, just a couple questions. Um, I mean, yeah, I think it's really great news. Nobody likes going to the hospital if it can be avoided. The 17% of calls that are eligible, um, I, know, I realize this is an unusual time. Um, did, do you think it's likely to stay around that number? Um, I mean, I could, I, I, I'm interested in thinking and wondering if, if you're, you think it might increase as operators get more familiar with using this approach, or maybe it's artificially high under COVID with more people home and less serious injuries or something. Have you, what do you expect? 
Yeah, so uh, the 17% number came from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, and uh, that was a multi-year study okay. where they were looking at retrospective billing data. Uh, I, I want to have a little bit of caution about that. Uh, so, for example, if uh, a 67-year-old woman went to the emergency room with uh, complaints of abdominal pain uh, and was later uh, just found to have uh, a bellyache due to overeating, uh, that doesn't discount the fact that the emergency room physician had to run several tests on her that were only available at the ED. Right. Uh, so that would skew the, the Medicare numbers uh, higher than what they should have been. Uh, so that's why our initial estimate was more conservative. And we had based that looking on data uh, from prior to COVID uh, that we looked at hospital outcomes uh, from, from Holy Cross Hospital, and they were very essential to helping us with that process. So now during COVID, as has been alluded to, we are seeing even within the low acuity patients uh, that they're still tending to be a little bit more serious than, than baseline. Uh, my expectation would be as we come out of COVID that we'll return to what is quote unquote, quote normal, uh, but that's just a prediction. Mm -hmm. um, sorry. No, I just wanted to make sure that made sense. Makes sense to me. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I thought somebody else was jumping in. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, um, glad you're looking into the funding opportunities. Is there an, um, an estimate of how much we might get from CMMI? No, as, as I stated, the, uh, the details are pretty detailed. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess whether we get it or not, what are the staffing implications of the nurse triage line going forward? I mean, do we add more positions for to cover that? Is that going to re, uh, re, re, result in a uh, less need for um, EMS in the future? How will that work out? Yeah, so very early to tell. It would depend on what uh, qualifications are needed for that to, to get the uh, Medicare reimbursement. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the, uh, the DC and the, and the Las Vegas experience uh, would be uh, uh, illustrative. I don't, I don't have those figures at the tips, my fingertips in terms of call reductions. Sure. Uh, I do know in both cases, they're not staffing their nurse triage lines around the clock. Uh, they're doing it more during the busy times of the day. And obviously, uh, there would have to be uh, positions added to ECC to to facilitate that. Uh, but what the, those costs would be would would depend on the qualifications that are needed. And uh, I just, you know, it's too early to to say what that would be. Sure. Okay. President Tucker, as as Alan outlined, the, the the timing, you know, that may be a 14 or 16 hour a day, two two eight hour shifts style uh, arrangement to to cover the the peaks. There are, uh, it's a great opportunity within fire rescue. We do have a, a cadre of, you know, current FRS personnel that are certified nurses, and we could implement a beginning trial of, of a nurse triage line with the, the support of, of the uh, legislative and executive branch using those folks, but it would be definitely our intent to have purposely hired uh, practitioners for those but, but positions. The best way I like to phrase uh, what nurse triage, what, what telemedicine, what alternative destination does, it abates the need, the, the critical need for as many additional EMS transport units as the demand for EMS continues to increment up and up and up. These alternatives allow the current capacity, which is roughly not roughly 42 cots, roughly 40 cots, but the current capacity to handle the the increasing load because we're not taking as many people to uh, freestanding emergency rooms. We're not sending as many dispatched units to calls because they're being hand, handled through the nurse triage line mm -hmm. or they're being you know uh, dropped off or taking people to urgent care facilities Not and, and our units are back in service faster. So these are strategies to to maintain the, the service capability we have without needing specifically additional EMS units. 
um, and utilizing the units we have better and, and more efficiently. So I don't believe we will see as as natural trend in, in call volume goes up and up that that we have the uh, ability to reduce capacity or, or uh, um, but that's where I look at this as abating the need for additional units by these alternative means of, of supporting their medical care. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, and I assume this is uh, the hospitals are excited about this. This right it unburdens them from some emergency room visits. Yes, we've discussed it at our our bi monthly. Uh, meetings that we have with all of our emergency room partners and uh, I, I think I can say unequiv unequivocally they all are pretty happy about it um, as well the uh, the physicians group that we're partnering with to uh, to do the telehealth component is they're all emergency room physicians that practice here in, in Montgomery County uh, so they're very familiar with with the conditions that we operate under and uh, if they weren't excited about it, uh, they wouldn't be participating with us. Right. No, I imagine um, this is good news for them. Uh, I, I, I don't know if maybe it's too early to have kind of conversations with our state lawmakers about this, but um, I mean, if uh, I wouldn't expect the hospitals necessarily to, to chip in, that would be nice to think, but they probably won't. But um, uh, our state lawmakers are always interested in um, doing anything to lower the, you know, the cost, the burden on the hospitals. Um, so um I wonder if we don't want to bring it to their attention, seek any state, if there's any state funding opportunities on this. Yeah, actually, I've been involved with some state conversations. Uh, it's being run through the CHRC. Great. Uh, but they're looking at uh, EMS reimbursement overall. Uh, right now, we, uh, you know, we were incentivized to, to transport to emergency rooms only. Uh, so that's why the Medicare program was a, a big departure from that historical norm. But they are looking at it from the state perspective. Uh, the state Medicaid administration is an active participant in that group. And uh, so although COVID has kind of slowed the, the momentum down, uh, they are very mindful and, and very attentive to what's going on. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you all for all your hard work on this. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. You always, we don't get a lot of good news and we often get the good news we have from, from you all. So I appreciate that and your, um, continued efforts to innovate um, in your in your area. Thanks. Thank you. And um, with that, Ms. Farag, did you have anything else on this topic? I don't. I'll just stay in touch with OMB and the department as we move into the recommended FY22 discussions of the budget. So. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you to all the chiefs for being with us. And, and Chief Kaufman, uh, you did a great job. And hopefully you'll come back to visit. Hopefully we didn't scare <laughs> you so much that you won't come back to visit. So we appreciate it. Thank you. And with that, we're going to move to our second topic. And that's also Mrs. Ms. Frog's uh, packet. And this is on the police department staffing. And with that, if Susan, if you could please le begin leading us through the packet. Sure. And I'm going to do most of the talking on this one, although the department is here to answer questions and I hope that they can provide the overview of all of their current recruiting efforts because they've really made proactive efforts and gotten pretty creative um, during COVID as far as trying to recruit new um, police officers. So today's briefing, you had a very comprehensive briefing on staffing back in 2019. Today's briefing is looking more to, to prepare for the context of whatever types of police reforms you might have to consider moving forward. Um, it's looking primarily at sworn staffing, but I do have one component of civilian staffing for you to look at as far as planning and data is concerned. Um, what is MCPD sworn staffing now as it relates to its current mission? Um, we'll go over some common methods that police departments nationwide use to determine their appropriate law enforcement staffing. And, and we'll talk more about the recruitment and the retention challenges that the department has been experiencing for a while now. And there's also an uptick, um, especially with retention, having some concerns about retention. Um, also wanted to bring in uh, looking at staffing now to look how to best meet the county's goals of reducing racial inequities and providing for safer policing too, both for the community and for police officers and at the same time, maintaining the high levels of public safety for the entire community. 
I'm going to go briefly over uh, police staffing in the department for the past 15 years and how they've generally determined their appropriate staffing needs to meet um, community public safety needs. As, as you know, there are multiple entities right now looking at police practices and recommending changes. Um, any adopted changes to the police operations will require a similar determination of appropriate staffing to meet those goals. Uh, the different entities that are looking right now are the Executive's Task Force to Reimagine Public Safety. They just recently issued their report, which has 87 recommendations on changes. Uh, the council created the Policing Advisory Commission a year or so ago. That was um, it started up in September, and they're looking at different aspects of police reform as well. The executive hired an outside consultant, ELE4A, and they're conducting a departmental audit. And part of that departmental audit is supposed to include looking at staffing and how it meets current needs. Their preliminary results are due sometime later this spring. I don't think it's going to be early enough for us to really consider it during budget, but I am keeping an eye on it. And of course, you know, MCPS is looking at the school resource officer program and final recommendations are due in May, I believe. And additionally, the chief's touched on this in public a few times, but not into any depth. The chief has a proposed reorganization of the department to better serve the community. Um, and it would be interesting to know moving forward, maybe not in depth today, but how that might, you know, create efficiencies as far as staffing is concerned to meet those needs of the, of the community. Um, I wanted to start it with the 2004 is the earliest documentation I have. The department had proposed a five year staffing plan back then to increase staff by over 200 sworn officer and civilian positions. Um, I can't say one way or the other if they were truly understaffed, but being understaffed is an ongoing theme that I hear as I deal with budget deliberations in the department. Um, at the time, the department had about 1,100 officers, and the department felt they needed those additional positions to provide the highest quality services to its residents. They did, in fact, receive 89 sworn positions over the next three years, and that brought the sworn complement up to about 1,200 in 2008. And then, of course, the recession hit. That forced cuts across all of county services, and the police department lost 55 of those new 89 sworn positions. Uh, former Chief Major followed up on this, and he had a proposed new staffing plan for FY 13 through 15 that would add 120 new sworn positions, and the department, in fact, did receive 106 of those over the next three years. I've got a breakout of what they received, um, which I'm not going to go into too much detail, but starting in FY 13, the biggest addition was 34 new police officers to create the six district community action teams. Um, they also received seven detectives. A lot of these were going off the staffing plan, the identified needs that they had, and to deal with um, proactive community policing initiatives that would help problem solve within the communities with the least number of officers, you know, necessary. Instead of broadly, broadly expanding patrol, they started off with these initial DCAT teams. And as the years went on, they looked at different hot spots and central business districts to add staffing to. Um, they added a crisis intervention team position, and they also spent several years building back up the school resource officer program. Um, it's unclear to me if there were any subsequent staffing plans after that FY 13 through 15. Um, they did receive, however, 12 new officers in FY 17. Six of those were to address Mary Sector hotspots, and six were added by council. And if you'll recall, that was the year that there were, there was a huge increase in the number of homicides, gang-related homicides. And the council approved a supplemental appropriation that added six new officers to the police department and added six positions to the state's attorney's office to address um, gang related activity. They received 15 new officers in FY 18. Uh, they didn't get any in FY 19, although the public safety committee added one detective at that point and three new school resource officers in FY 20. The council also added two, two new school resource officer positions in FY 21 last year during COVID. Uh, the chief had proposed four new officer positions for a police athletic league, but the council did not fund those under a continuity of services budget. Uh, just briefly touching on the different methods of uh, determining appropriate staffing, um, the common methods across the nation include per capita staffing, and that would be one police officer per every thousand residents, uh, conducting workload analyses that deals with um, caseloads, calls for service, case closures, how fast they can and close you know, call and return back to patrol, minimum staffing for each police district, different crime trends, and authorized budgets. And the FY 13-15 staffing plan was based on all of those. 
Um, in practice, of course, budget-driven staffing is very common, you know, particularly given the recession that we had now during COVID and revenues of tanks. So, you know, we are, you know, realistically constrained by what the budget provides. Um, it's not ideal, obviously, because it doesn't often meet the community-driven policing needs. And I wanted to highlight this piece for the committee to consider as they look at any proposed reforms that come down the pike. It's critical to make sure that the police department has the appropriate staff to deliver those change services that you want. They are currently under a lot of public scrutiny. The entire county is under public scrutiny as far as how we address these different issues in the community. And if, you know, there are requirements of them and it's not appropriately staffed or resourced with um, equipment, IT needs, that type of thing, it, it likely could be setting them up for failure and not delivering the exact services that the county wants to deliver. Um, and those historically are the types of ways they look at how to determine staffing. More recently, the conversation has been considered within the context of racial equity and social justice. I just wanted to point out that that's not really new, even though the conversation is really at the forefront right now. Um, President Obama had convened a task force to study 21st century policing back in 2015. And the report issued at that point was based on six pillars meant to strengthen the community policing and trust among law enforcement officers and the communities that they serve. But those pillars actually stemmed from and expanded on existing policing goals and best practices, um, which include what very critical is procedural justice. You know, the fairness in the processes, how police officers are treating a member of the community during that interaction, the transparency of those actions, an opportunity for that community member to have a voice and impartiality in decision making. And if a community member perceives that the conduct of the police to be fair even if the community member doesn't get the outcome they want, you know, unfortunately, if they are arrested or their case can't be solved, um, they still tend to have high trust in the police if we can hold on to that procedural justice element. And of course, other ones that the council has been talking about, uh, trust and accountability, hiring diverse and local police officers, residents um, to be part of the police department. Um, and of course, community policing and positive Non, allowing for positive non-enforcement contacts. Um, at, while I was doing my research, I found several police departments in the region that have built their racial equity and social justice plans around those six pillars in, the, in President Obama's report. Um, I do know that MCPD had convened a work group of their executive staff and other subject matter experts, and they went through all of the recommendations in that report and went through their own operations item by item to, to determine whether or not they were meeting those goals. And for the most part, it indicated they were. But they also identified at that time um, some places where they could do enhancements, and they implemented changes, including the outside review of officer-involved deaths, uh, the body-worn camera program, and they also enhanced some community policing initiatives. So what does staffing look like today for the department? So um, police departments report their per capita staffing to the FBI, and that's reported every year as part of the Uniform Crime Reports. And while counties average 2.8 officers per capita and suburban jurisdictions average 2.5 officers per capita, MCPT, MCPD has averaged about 1.2 officers per capita for more than a decade. And again, that's not that's not one measure alone, right? Because every di jurisdiction is different. We have a different um, mix of of people, different um, you know urban areas and rural areas. We have different crime trends. We have different socioeconomic factors. Um, but it does help to better understand what's going on. And on page six, I've got a chart of some different factors just to compare MCPD and Fairfax County, which we get compared to a lot. Um, I'm pulling that up just so I can look at it too. Um, it shows difference in torn, sworn staff. And I just wanted to point out these are authorized positions. They're not necessarily filled. So the given complement on any particular day is likely lower than that. Um, same for Fairfax County. Um, we have more civilian staff. The Montgomery County Police police a smaller area if slightly lower population um, the per capita police officers 1.24 compared to Fairfax which is 1.32 um, Montgomery County has six stations Fairfax County has eight I believe they are building their ninth um, Montgomery County has more calls for service and that translate into more calls per sworn officer 
And I need to qualify the response times um, item. Ours is significantly higher, and the committee has reviewed this over the past several years, and response times have been increasing slightly, but that's due almost completely due to processing steps taken at the Emergency Communications Center. And I was told by MCPD that Fairfax actually starts their clock at a later time when they actually dispatch the police officer. So that would account for at least a good chunk of that difference there. I did note the starting salary because that does um, indicate a challenge here as far as hiring, 52,000 for MCPD versus 57,000 for Fairfax. Um, I have a, a report and evaluation on minority recruitment process back from the year 2000 under Chief Moose, which indicated that starting salaries could be a burden as far as trying to recruit people, although they did have some recommended changes to look at that, that we could discuss in more detail. Um, I've also listed the budgets, and I just wanted to make it clear on the Fairfax County budget. When you look at public documents available on the web, it's a much lower figure than that $297 million. They do a different type of budgeting uh, where they include most of their employee benefits in a separate account. So it will be different, but MCPD provided this number to me through Fairfax County. And then just a department cost per capita. And that's department cost. That's not sworn, um, sworn officer cost. So um, the other thing I wanted to, to bring to the committee's attention is patrol staffing, because this is the front facing piece of the police department to the community. This is a common topic in an area where a lot of the police reform conversations have taken place. Um, there's a list on page seven as far as what patrol staffing currently is. And I wanted to point out that the ICMA is, which is, um, does, conducts a lot of workload analyses for police departments, uses what they call as a rule of 60. And that is 60% of sworn patrol officers, I mean, sworn officers in a department should be dedicated to patrol. And of that officer's time, 60% should be running calls for service, which leaves additional time out there to engage in problem solving policing, helping communities solve their problems. Um, concerns, solve crimes, also engage in proactive non-enforcement activities with the community. And a lot of that goes back to the, to the information outlined, the recommendations outlined in the 21st century policing report, and that is to engage in community policing to help increase trust between law enforcement and the communities they served. Um, back in FY19, the committee had discussed its concern about vacancies in the 3rd District, and at that time there were 10 vacancies in 3D for a total of 23 vacancies in patrol. For the entire department at the time, there were 38 sworn vacancies at the time, and that reflected the highest vacancy rate of 3% that year. Today, there's 70 vacancies out of the 1306 authorized position, or about 5%. I also wanted to note that they're in the process of civilianizing a couple of positions. Um, so that authorized complement, I believe, is down to 1304 now. Um, I thought, uh, due to some of the reports I had, that there were 20 vacancies in patrol, but there's actually 16. And I um, made an error on that due, due to some pooled positions. So I just wanted to point that out. I do want to note that 12 of those 16 um, vacancies reflect a loss in FY21 of two district community action teams. One was in 1D or Rockville, and the other one is in 2D or Bethesda. And the current vacancy rate for non-sworn staff is 110 out of 795, or about 13.8%. A lot of that will be due to the savings plan and lapsing lots of positions, as well as there's um, a hiring freeze going on, um, and you need to get exemptions to be able to hire, but we can discuss that in more detail if you like to. And as I noted before, while this briefing is focusing primarily on the sworn staff, it is within the context of police reform. Um, so professional non-sworn policy and planning staff are critical to the department's ability to provide all of the data that everybody and their brother is asking for right now. We have so many different groups asking the police for data about everything under the sun, plus um, Maryland Public Information Act requests on that data. So the department had two civilian planners who had helped analyze data and generate various reports. Um, those planners also handled the outside requests for the specific data. Both of those incumbents left the department last year, although it's my understanding that one of them's back on contract, but the other position's vacant and it's been lapsed in order to meet the FY21 savings plan target. Um, I did want to bring to your attention for the bill that the council is considering right now, the amendment to the community policing bill, which adds data element requirements and report requirements. The fiscal impact statement was just sent over for that bill 4520. 
and it um, indicates that two new positions would be needed to handle the expected workload, and that includes a program specialist two for about $95,000 um, and a senior IT specialist position for about $125,000. In addition, there's a vacant lapsed IT supervisor position that would also have to be filled. Um, this policy and planning function is supposed to be placed under the new civilian assistant chief position. Um, and as we get into the question part of this, it would be helpful for the committee to understand the timeline for creating that bureau and the proposed structure. The next thing I wanted to touch briefly on is retention challenges. So not only are there recruitment issues trying to bring people in, but there are significant um, retention challenges and annual sworn attrition patterns that are showing increased problem in keeping officers on staff. And so not only does retention maintain force strength, but it maintains experienced and knowledgeable officers who can help guide the newer officers through challenging situations. Uh, when I first started looking at this budget, they assumed resignation of one person per month. Um, and that's that inched up to 1.5 people a month. And now it's two people a month that they're assuming. And there's been an increase not only in um, Early retirements, people who are leaving before they are, you know, fully vested in the discontinued retirement service plan, which for anyone who doesn't know, officers are financially incentivized to enter the DRSP for up to three years before retirement. Um, and that actually is a great planning tool for the department or has been historically, and it makes their actual departures easier to forecast so they can better, you know, compose an appropriate size recruit class and fund that. Um, the department's noticed an increase in the number of officers who have registered for the DRSP since COVID. In 2019, 32 officers entered the DRSP, but in 2020, that almost doubled with 62 officers entering the DRSP. And there's a chart that reflects that on page nine of the staff report. Um, there's also some concerns, some anecdotal concern that the COVID differential, which just ended, had provided um, a financial incentive for many police officers to stay with the department during a very challenging year, and that the department may see a significant increase in resignations now that that's ended, and that's something that we can track moving forward into FY22. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to the police department to discuss their recruitment challenges and what they've been doing to bring people in during COVID, and then I just had a few um, suggested ideas for the committee to consider as it moves forward through the both the police reform um, process that we'll see, as well as the FY22 recommended budget. Thank you very much, Susan. And with that, we're going to uh, um, go to Chief Jones. And Chief Jones, welcome to our meeting. And, and please uh, um, identify those who are with you today as well. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Chair, and to uh, Council President uh, Hucker and Council Vice President Albernaz, uh, good morning to you all. Um, this morning I have with me uh, Captain uh, Nick Augustine. He is the Director of our Personnel Division. Um, I also have with me uh, Lieutenant Ian Clark, um, who is representing uh, Assistant Chief Nadish Patel from the Management Services Bureau, and I also have our, our uh, director of our uh, budget division, uh, Neil Shore. Um, so um, as we can move this uh, forward, I am going to have Captain Augustine present on our recruiting efforts. Good morning and thank you for uh, having me this morning. Um, starting last year in March, prior to the COVID pandemic, um, we started looking at ways to bring more applicants uh, into the processing and making it more convenient for the applicants to test and uh, be available. Prior to March, we were just offering our first part of the test on a Saturday once a month. And that raised concerns to me that if you're not available on a Saturday, are we really going to receive you? Are you still going to apply to Montgomery County Police? So we looked at, looked into remote testing. And luckily, our vendor that we used for our testing had an option for uh, remote testing, which really wasn't being used in this area. So prior to COVID, we um, put that out for applicants that were greater than an hour away from our testing location or had a reason that they could not test on a Saturday. And we started processing um, those remote tests. It was a financial cost to us, but since we were limiting the number of applicants that were eligible for this, um, it wasn't significant. 
Once the pandemic happened and uh, restrictions were put into place on in-person meetings and testings, we then opened this up to all applicants that apply to begin uh, testing remotely. Uh, we continued that uh, when we're having 483 applicants for the position. What we typically saw prior and uh, reaching out to people is we would only have 31% of our total number of applicants take the next step of taking the written test. So one of our goals was to significantly um, bring that percentage up so we have more testing, so our pool is greater. And with our remote testing and then going into remote interviews through uh, Zoom, the only first contact we're having with an applicant is during our physical utility testing. So for session 72, which is now in the academy, we brought it up from 31% up to 56% of our applicants that are applying are now going on to the next step. Um, this is significant to help with uh, applicants that are attending college across the U.S. or military that are deployed, giving an opportunity for everyone to test, increasing our greater pool, um, not just applicants, but diverse applicants also. Um, moving into that, one of the main reasons we were getting applicants is through our advertising and our career fairs. Well, COVID put a halt to that as universities and colleges were being dismissed and they were not having any activities. Uh, luckily, uh, colleges came on board and started doing virtual career fairs, which has significantly helped us expand our reach, where I no longer have to send recruiters uh, three hours to go handle a job fair. They can handle multiple job fairs a day while teleworking or remote um, all across the United States. So it does give us a greater option out there to have that ability to reach applicants all over rather than us having to commute. My recruitment staff is free, so I do have a limited number of uh, recruitment staff that are sworn, but I do have a large complement of decentralized recruiters, which are officers that are working their normal functions, but also serve as recruiters um, when we need them, or sometimes they go to their old college and recruit there as they have knowledge of the programs at their prior university. So we're, we're looking at that, and we also started um, using technology with Zoom and hosting our own Ask a Recruiter program. So we advertise that through social media and increase our social media presence out there. But have um, more unique and smaller sessions where a potential applicant can ask specific questions um, to address the department that they might not be seeing if we were out in the uh, community. So those are steps we have taken. We have not seen a significant decrease in the numbers of applicants since COVID started. Um, it's still remaining around 483 for the session that we have uh, scheduled for July. We currently have around 300, 340 applicants for that, and that'll be open for another um, month or so. So there's a slightly lower number there, but we're hoping again to see that higher number of applicants taking the test. So we have a larger pool to move through the process. Um, the current class we have in now is uh, 14 um, recruits in that class. So, um, I, and also to add to that, seven out of 14 are uh, from Montgomery County. So 50% of that class that is currently in um, are from Montgomery County. I would say that number would also increase saying the number that have ties to Montgomery County, whether their family resides in Montgomery County, they have another family member that is a member of the department. I would say that would also probably reach around uh, 10. So we continue to recruit that and having our cadet program to bring in um, diverse applicants um, through the line and kind of raising them into um, law enforcement, hopefully keeping them when they are eligible to uh, apply for the police department. Great. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Chair, I would also add that um, two cadets that currently are um, who are actually now recruits, um, who were cadets, um, who are in our current academy, and both of them are Spanish-speaking, um, our uh, candidates. So we are very excited about the um, about the outcomes that have come as a result of our cadet program, and we continue to look for success in that particular program as well. Very good. Anything else? If not, we're going to turn back to Susan. No, I think that uh, we will have more to discuss. Okay, thank you. Susan, you're on mute. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, I just put some, some things for the committee to consider as we move forward on pages 15 and 16. As I mentioned before, the police chief has a proposed reorganization plan 
uh, for the department. It's been delayed due to police reform efforts to, you know, to get everything in gear to understand what direction we're we're headed in. It would be helpful to understand the timeline for implementation of that plan and whether there are any proposed policy or budgetary changes, um, whether any of the proposed budgetary changes by the executive will impact that moving into FY22. Um, and as they look at, as you look at proposed reform efforts to keep in mind the racial equity goals, tr trust and accountability reforms, and they relate back to the police best practices, um, there is Evidence-based that community policing um, does both build trust within the community of police as well as create safer policing. Um, there's also evidence-based data that shows that recruiting locally helps increase both of these goals. Um, it would be helpful. I don't know what time, what when in the spring that the audit is due for preliminary results to be released, but it would be helpful to understand if that's providing a full workload analysis as it relates to the county's stated public goals, both what it's doing now and what it plans on doing in the future. Um, and we stated a little bit before about how COVID differential might um, impact retention efforts. And to what extent does understaffing impact the ability to proactively strengthen community relations uh, through positive non-enforcement engagements? Do police have the time to, you know, it's hard right now during COVID, um, but do the police have the time to actually engage in these types of um, interactions with the community? And then I listed a few ways that the committee may want to explore uh, to strengthen recruitment and retention through um, policies such as the property tax credit for public safety officers, which the General Assembly enabled a few years ago, and that would provide up to a $2,500 credit property tax relief for first responders who live in the county. If um, the committee is looking at ways to keep or recruit people who live in the county to stay here. Again, I'll refer to that 2000 report I had on minority recruitment process, and they found a strong association between recruiting from the county and people who really wanted to help the communities and serve the communities from where they come from. So um, other opportunities for attracting local residents to the profession include the cadet program that they just discussed, and that offers 20 hours of paid employment each week for certain individuals enrolled in college. And there's been some discussion or requests, I believe, from some of the cadets that the program um, actually be extended from the two years that it's currently funded for um, to more than two years. I don't know if that's to allow people to move further through their college process or what, but that is something that the uh, committee could look at in more depth. And on the retention side of things, um, particularly due to those early retirements and the, the increase, the uptick in people who are registering for the drop, um, some retention enhancements could include ensuring that the police leadership service salary schedule, which council approved several years ago, then it kind of mirrors the management leadership service uh, pay scale that the county has in general. Um, there have been some incidents where lieutenants and captains are earning less than the sworn staff that they supervise. So, you know, if they're not getting the same kinds of general wage adjustments that people in the FOB uh, collective bargaining salary schedule are getting, there's going to be more and more salary compression. Um, and the COVID differential actually provided to the FOP members significantly exacerbated that issue since management level staff didn't receive any type of differential pay. And that just, it, anecdotally, I've just heard that that can cause some hard feelings and further stress. So that might be something, a, a real salary um, review of the region, as well as how salary functions within the department, practically speaking, might be helpful moving forward. Um, some of the things I'm concerned about, and I'm going to be looking at budget, it would be helpful when the budget comes across the street, would be helpful to understand um, appropriate supervision levels um, and other staff-based accountability enhancements that might be proposed. For example, would more first-line supervisory sergeant positions help ensure consistent professional police work among pr patrol officers? Um, is there a room or a need or a benefit to having additional review of body worn cameras? And that's not just to catch any wrongdoing, but also to look at um, professional treatment of the public by the police officers. Um, and is there any additional staffing needed for in the internal affairs division to ensure timely uh, review of any complaints that are brought to their attention? And again, I'm just putting these out there as things that the committee might, might want to consider as moving forward. I realize particularly with things like the body worn camera um, review, I think there might be, you know, need for more civilian positions to do that, but there might also be some bargaining issues that come to play in that. Um, 
but that's all I have at this point, and I just wanted to help uh, committee set the stage for what I assume will be a lot of different types of recommendations coming their way over the next few months and possibly over the next year or so. And, and thank you for all of all of those suggestions. I believe, and and the committee uh, members I can agree or disagree, uh, but I believe we should have pretty much comprehensive discussions about every one of the topics that you discussed. Um, I don't know that we need to do it in depth. We need to to look at retention and recruitment and retention. We need to figure out where we are and where we need to be. And I think we need to have individual discussions on on the man, the many topics that you discussed today. So if if my uh, committee member colleagues agree, uh, we could ask Susan to. I got a I got a, at least one. I got two thumbs up here. So Susan, can you please uh, put it? I know that that schedules get tight, and we're going to have to figure out how to do it. But it's very important that we do it, and we hopefully can do it before or as close to part of the discussions on on our budget. So I, Wait, I appreciate it. I plan to bring them up as the budget issues are brought across the street for FY22, but I'm very much looking forward to the preliminary recommendations or findings of the audit that's being conducted on the police department. And that's due sometime later this spring. And we could, you could probably use that as a baseline to start looking at different aspects of staffing and resources um, as the police move forward on any proposed changes. It's a good suggestion. And chief on her, on the many uh, items, uh, ideas that she, uh, uh, Susan brought up, uh, did you have any comment on, on any of those, please? Yes. So uh, thank you. So, And I think Susan did a fabulous job, and I appreciate her uh, in-depth look at, uh, at the staffing issues. Um, the one thing that I think is very important for this committee to understand, um, as you all know, uh, Mr. Chair, we presented, uh, I presented the reorganizational plan um, last year, um, June of 2020, um, to make some changes, uh, reallocate positions, um, existing positions within the department to, you know, to move positions around to make, I believe, the department to become more efficient. Um, I have spoken with the county executive this week um, to move that plan forward. He has agreed uh, to allow me to move the plan forward. Um, and as you know, that uh, um, a vast majority of the plan, the, some of those positions would be moved to a central traffic division of a more direct focus um, to assist with our uh, traffic issues all across the county. Um, and so that is uh, in motion. There are other aspects of that plan um, of positions where I, I am eliminating the first and second district DCAT teams, um, but I want to make sure that people understand that my other DCAT teams are highly engaged and if there is a need um, for any, um, um, any use of those teams in the first or second district due to any specific problem that needs to be resolved, um, we are committed to moving those resources to the first and second districts in order to be able to assist them as needed. Um, but we're just looking for more efficiency um, across the board. And that's one of the reasons why I've eliminated those teams to help us assist with um, traffic uh, issues. I am also providing and not stripping the districts of traffic complaint officers to be able to address particularly issues on our, our non-major arterial roadways so that we make sure that if there are neighborhood complaints um, in our residential neighborhoods um, or even commercial neighborhoods that we need to address these particular complaints, that these officers, there will be two assigned to each district, um, and there will be supervisory, um, administrative supervisory positions to be able to assist the districts with that as well. There's one change to the, uh, that the county executive uh, wanted and I, I agreed with um, as part of my reorganizational plan um, and Susan hit on it, was the addition of two internal affairs investigators to be added to my current complement of internal affairs investigators. Um, due to the volume of their caseloads, not only just the volume of their caseloads, 
um, you know, the, the increased use of body worn cameras um, in an investigation requires a lot of time and energy uh, for these investigators to go through and document, um, review video footage, um, all of the like. Um, and that is an added piece to their added workload. So this will help to address our uh, backlog in investigations, our timelines of handling um, internal complaints um, that we receive from internally uh, from our department, but most importantly from the community. Um, so we are going to uh, add two positions um, to the internal affairs division as a result of this plan um, that uh, um, and will re, re, uh, reallocate um, our previous, um, and we haven't finally decided what that will look like, but we will add the internal affairs division directors. And as you are aware um, that you uh, approved the civilian assistant chief's position, yeah. um, and I wanted to give you an update on that. We had 133 applicants wow. for that wow. particular job. Um, I have finally dwindled down a final five um, that we will be interviewing within um, in the month of March. Um, and uh, we hope to have a decision um, of recommendation to the county executive for appointment, um, hopefully by uh, late March, early April at the latest, um, to hopefully have that name over to the council for approval. That will create the additional Bureau, as as uh, noted to this uh, to the council of uh, the community resources bureau, which that chief will lead. Um, that chief will oversee our um, our uh, public our our excuse me our policy and planning division. Um, it would also include uh, oversight of our uh, of, uh, public information office, um, and it will also o oversee community engagement division. Part of my um, also reorganizational plan is to move the positions that are currently the SROs that are currently serving um, um, our public schools. All of those positions will be moved under the direction of the community engagement division um, to have one um, director uh, to provide direction as we continue and work through um, our relationship with Montgomery County Public Schools. And as we know, there's pending legislation, so I don't know what the end result of that will be, but that will be the structure no matter what the result, because we know that we'll still have to have um, the adequate law enforcement coverage, regardless of the, the final uh, decision. Um, and therefore, um, I have a plan that uh, we'll be able to go either way, um, whether we keep our school resource officers program at, um, you know, in some um, revamped form or that we need to, to deal with this. I do not have the adequate um, uh, staffing. Um, if SROs were eliminated, I clearly don't have the staffing available to provide adequate law enforcement coverage um, to all 200 schools um, based upon my current day work complement um, in our six district stations for the amount of schools that we have in Montgomery County. Um, so therefore, that's why those positions are very important that even if they're not so-called SROs, but they're still going to be um, a need for those officers to provide some adequate law enforcement coverage um, and from that staffing standpoint. So um, I think, uh, you know, those are some of my, um, some of the plans. I think that we will be able to have a majority of this plan in place by July 1st. That is that is our goal, um, particularly <laughs> when we look at the um, the appointment of a new civilian assistant chief, um, as well as um, the um, the the process which will will take for some of the positions that will be competitive positions for our officers to actually compete for positions such as in the traffic division. Thank you. Um, anything else, Susan? If not, I'm going to turn to some questions, but Chief, when, when, the, um, when the whole idea of, and we're starting to see in Montgomery County an uptick, um, unfortunately, horribly, in homicides and carjackings, and is there any, for the staffing side, is there anything that we're doing or should be doing to uh, help alleviate those, those horrible concerns? 
Yeah, I mean, those are, of course, are, are, are horrible in their own right. I mean, the homicide uh, piece, when we really break down the different uh, of how could we write, uh, could, is there any opportunity to have prevented that? Um, you know, there's a wide variety of, of sort of the reasons why some of these cases occurred. Uh, what were the motives behind? Some are, again, there were uh, a couple of cases that were domestic related. There were some cases that were acquaintance related. Um, out of our eight homicides, um, which occurred within six weeks of the, of the first six weeks of this year, which is unprecedented. We've never had seven homicides in one month. Um, in Montgomery County, not during the, that anyone can remember. Um, and so it's unprecedented in its own right. Um, but there was really no common factor that we could, uh, you know, and we have four that are unsolved. So we're not quite sure in all of those cases, um, though we have some theories of what the actual motives um, are. There's, you know, one we may believe that may be drug related. One may be a retaliation. Uh, so we, we're, we're trying to figure out um, and get to the bottom of those particular cases. As it relates to um, the increase of, of carjackings, and we have had nearly a 40% jump in our robberies in the county, um, which is, is, again, it is a, you know, a disturbing trend. Um, we have really focused more resources um, in areas such as Silver Spring and Bethesda where the majority of our carjackings have occurred. And, and, that's, and so we've sort of reallocated some existing resources, which has really not been a problem for us, uh, which is the good news from that standpoint. But it's still the fact that these things continue to happen um, on some of our, and in fact, there was one that had just occurred on Saturday. Um, I think it was either Friday, no, I think it was Friday night. Um, and we had some additional resources in, in, the, in downtown Silver Spring we were able to, we were not able to capture the individuals before they entered the District of Columbia, but we've been working with uh, Metropolitan Police Department and other federal authorities to address this particular crime trend. And we were able to actually, uh, no, I should say we, the Metropolitan Police Department was able to make an arrest of an individual who actually uh, carjacked that vehicle in, in Silver Spring on Friday. Um, so that is again, working in partnership in order to try to resolve some of these issues, but you know, when these things come up, this shows you how we will have to move resources around and address these problems um, as they begin to increase in our community. Um, and uh, it's something that we really don't want to take our um, our eyes off because we want to make sure the community is safe and understanding that these issues again will be made. Several uh, public information announcements about carjackings in our community, as we've seen this increase. Um, I think there's an article in the Washington Post today that also demonstrates this as being a national issue. Um, it's not just a Washington, D.C., Montgomery County issue. This is a national issue, but it has impacted our community. And, and on the local level, we need to be solving it. So, oh, absolutely. 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 And Susan, on the whole uh, discussion about staffing, and, and um, I do think in some place we should have Though we talk about the staffing for uh, Montgomery County Police Department, and we certainly need to be concerned about that, but we also have other agencies in Montgomery County that should, in in my opinion, we should at least know what what uh, what the other agencies are staffing as well. Uh, Rockville City, Gaithersburg, okay. um, the sheriff. I mean, whatever, what other departments are involved, and in especially in the in, this, in the Rockville and Gaithersburg. Uh, the, they, uh, they're dispatched by, by uh, us right. as well. So I do think that would be helpful just to be able to compare what we're okay. doing. And on the whole concern, and there again, I think this has to be part of the comprehensive discussion for uh, uh, recruitment and, and retention. But it is a concern that, that air competition uh, is, is uh, offering close to $5,000 more for a starting salary for a police officer. And, and you know, we, we need to be competitive. And if we're going to be, continue to be attracting the, the best uh, of the best uh, to be in Montgomery County, then we need to be, we need to be competitive to, to ensure that. So, um, and with that council member, uh, council vice president, Oliver Knox. 
Thanks, Mr. President, or Mr. Chairman. Um, so I, so just, um, I, I'm going to, I have a lot of thoughts here. I'm going to try to connect the dots among, of the, among all of them and say this in a way that makes sense. Um, but first, I want to start by um, our council president and the chair of the Public Safety Committee acknowledged uh, the tremendous response of our MCPD to the Capitol riots. Um, I believe this is the first time we've had the chance to see you before us, Chief Jones. Uh, and I just want to thank you and your unit um, for stepping up. I learned yesterday, I didn't know this, but one of our officers suffered a head injury during the Capitol riots uh, and was hit on the head with a chair. Uh, and so my best to him and his family, my understanding he has recovered. Uh, and obviously, um, Officer Oates was shot uh, for a second time uh, while in the line of duty um, um, within the last several months. And so um, our best, obviously, to his family, and I know our council president uh, and the chair of our public safety committee, both publicly and through social media, uh, extended their appreciation for his sacrifice. And we, of course, send our best wishes to him and his family for a speedy recovery. Thank you. Um, we are at a major inflection point, as we all know. We are living and breathing it every day. Um, we know that we are at an inflection point in which we are trying to tackle head on uh, the systemic challenges that have led to some of the disproportionate challenges we've had within our criminal justice system um, that have been heartbreaking uh, and that have impacted generations. And we are doing our best uh, to correct that, to address those systemic challenges, and frankly, racism that has existed uh, in many facets, but also within our criminal justice system. But um, equally important, and on a parallel track, it's not an either or, um, we also need to think about the issues regarding retention and recruitment and training and ensuring that our Montgomery County Police Department um, has all that it needs to be able to serve all of our residents to the best of their ability and to make us all proud and to make sure that every resident has the same experience, regardless of what their racial background is or what zip code they live in or their gender identity or whether they're not, they're, they're a member of our LGBTQ plus community. Everybody should receive the same level of service, the same level of protection. And I know we strive for that every day, and I know we have a ways to go, um, but I have a great deal of faith in the men and women of our law enforcement in trying to meet this moment and adjust. But we also have to recognize that on a good day, these are very difficult jobs. And I, am, I have seen growing evidence uh, of the, the, the mental health strain on our officers. There is growing evidence of PTSD. Uh, and when I say this, there are some in our community that say, well, what about our, the community who's disproportionately impacted by the same criminal justice system? Again, it's not either or. <laughs> we, we have to make sure that we are addressing those systemic issues, but on a parallel track also addressing the very real and raw challenges before us with regards to recruitment and retention of officers. Montgomery County, I, I've grown up here, as, as, as all of you know, I've seen sort of the evolution in so many ways of our community and think we've evolved in really dramatically positive ways in so many ways. Um, but one of the things I've observed um, and have come to appreciate and better understand and learn while serving on this committee is that when you look at the leadership of our law enforcement right now, there's a significant percentage of the leadership within law enforcement that also grew up here in Montgomery County, that also lives here in Montgomery County, and that also has come up through the ranks. Uh, it's a best practice for us to identify our talented men and women who are willing to step up and serve in higher level positions of leadership. Um, and, and understanding, because we, we do need to continue to both maintain a high bar and raise it even further so that our officers coming in to MCPD are truly the best of the best, understand our culture, understand our DNA, appreciate the fact that we have such a beautifully diverse community in so many different ways, and know that going in, and have the best training, and have 
um, in many instances, an educational background that involves going to study in college and at a university. So it, it, it's, it's, I'm, I'm deeply concerned about where we are. And, and the recruitment challenges that we're experiencing here in our county are consistent with the recruitment challenges that other departments are facing across the country. They are not unique to Montgomery County. And we do need to take the appropriate steps to make sure that compensation is in line because that is an important investment. $5,000 a, a difference in the grand scheme of things is not a significant amount of money, but to keep us on par, I also think that management and leadership has to keep track with the GWA and other um, um, uh, you know, areas in which we have increased compensation. They have to keep track. Just sidebar, I used to work in the restaurant business um, um, and that's what actually helped pay for college. Uh, and I was super excited to be promoted to a manager when I worked at this restaurant, but then realized I made less as a manager than I did as a waiter. Uh, and that created all sorts of unusual and awkward challenges. Uh, and it also restrained people from wanting to become managers of this restaurant that I worked in. And you have to have folks in those positions that are A, willing to serve in those positions, but B, um, are really sort of understand what, what, what's going out, uh, on out there. So obviously, apples and watermelons compa comparison between restaurants and law enforcement and first responders. But I use that as an illustration uh, that we have to make sure that we work on keeping pace uh, with, with those salaries. And so as a follow-up, and I totally agree uh, with our chair's recommendation that we do a deeper dive, I do ask Ms. Farag as a follow-up to this, that we do a deeper dive on compensation adjustments um, at all levels um, okay. of, our, of MCPD, uh, certainly our rank and file uh, and FOP members, but also um, our, our private citizens uh, and, and um, MCPD management as well. I think that's important. Okay. Um, and I also think that um, I'm concerned about this, this potential for the perfect negative storm before us. Uh, we have 220,000 county residents in counting that have filed for unemployment. There are thousands of county <laughs> residents who are in crisis right now. Uh, and, and as we learned, and the chief alluded to the article, which was really well done by Tom Jackman and Dan Morse in the Washington Post today, um, the rise in carjackings is specifically among the, 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 the most represented groups are teenagers. The carjacking that occurred on Connecticut Avenue near Chevy Chase just a couple of, uh, um, um, a few weeks ago was perpetrated by a 15-year-old boy and a 13-year-old girl. And, and it's just, so when folks say, you know, it, you know we, we, we need to invest in mental health and prevention-based programs and yes, it's all of the above. It's all of the above. Um, we need to both address the immediate need before us and the very concerning alarm in crime that we are seeing, particularly in certain police districts, but also address the mental health issues and the prevention-based services that are also equally important and our equity hubs that we're trying to stand up for students right now. The work of the Street Outreach Network, Luis Cardona, has even more important weights uh, weight and importance right now. It's, it's not an either or. Uh, there, there has to be investments in those categories too, because clearly they are significantly linked. And so, um, and I also think quite frankly, you know, as policymakers, we have to watch our own rhetoric uh, in how we discuss these issues, um, because we have to acknowledge the challenges that are facing our first responders every day, um, while also lifting up and balancing and rightly focusing on those systemic changes that we're all working so hard to try and address and that it's gonna take some time, but I'm confident we're gonna end up in a much better place than we have been before. But in the meantime, we've gotta be careful in, in our words and in our actions uh, to make sure that we take into account these other challenges, the PTSD, um, because if we run into a situation in which the 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 folks that are eligible for retirement immediately take advantage of that retirement. And we don't have the recruitment classes with the same level of standards that we have had for many years. 
coming to backfill those positions and the growing social need that we have in our community because of the crisis before us, we're gonna fall off the rails. Uh, and, and we gotta be really careful uh, that, that obviously that not happen uh, and that we do everything we can uh, to, to raise all boats um, because that obviously is really important. So these are more comments than suggestions or questions, Mr. Chair. Um, but it's something I know all of us have been thinking about, all of us have been feeling. Um, there were a series of 80 plus recommendations within the police advisory and reimagining workforce, many of which are outstanding uh, and have a lot of merit, uh, but we have to be cautious and recommendations such as a 50% reduction in our police districts that right now have a significant increase in crime. Um, we have to be very cautious and very methodical uh, in, in how we implement and absorb and process and discuss those recommendations, particularly right now. So I, I'm confident that together we will be able to achieve this, um, but obviously it's not gonna be easy. And there will be people that disagree, people that disagree passionately um, with, with all sides of this. Um, but it's our responsibility to meet in the middle and it's our responsibility to take into account these very understandable raw emotions that we have right now, but in actual practice, make sure that we don't fall off the rails. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, again, there will be ongoing discussions regarding this, um, but I yield back to you. Thank you very, very much. And so very well said. I, I, you know, you, you certainly have hit on so many topics that we need to be discussing and that we need to be working with their uh, public safety community together to figure out what's the best uh, path forward. We have problems from many, many different directions, but that doesn't mean they get solved by themselves. We need to work together to, to help solve these. And with that, we're gonna ask President Hucker if he has anything to add. Um, just a few questions, Mr. I agree with everything um, Council Vice President said, especially um, my thanks for the contribution of uh, your officers to protect on protecting the Capitol and our democracy um, and, you know, as a district council member, I definitely want to thank you for your work on the carjacking and <clears throat> the robberies of uh, restaurant workers in uh, re restaurant owners in Silver Spring and a few other recent crimes. Now we uh, we have catalytic converter uh, thieves that are back. Um, on the um, but so if anybody needs to buy a catalytic converter, you know I know who to talk to. Uh, <laughs> on property tax break. Um, I, I know I've spoken to the chair about that. I may have dropped the ball on this when we had a staff transition, but I think we had a bill drafted and I'm checking with staff now on that, but I, I'd love to revisit that because I think it, it solves a couple different problems uh, or it doesn't solve them, but it might help to address them. Um, um, on retention, my question is um, the graph on page eight is interesting. And I know we've talked a lot about retirements but I don't remember spending so much time on resignations and that's a third of, or so of the attrition it looks like. Um, uh, uh, I guess for, for any of you, uh, Chief, wh why, what leads officers to resign uh, before their end of their career? How many, because um, you can't tell from the graph, how many do you feel like are leaving the profession versus how many are leaving for other police forces? Uh, and for the, that group B, how much is the pay differential uh, from other uh, jurisdictions a factor in them making lateral moves versus other factors? And do you have any analysis of that? So, yeah, so so um, our personnel division um, under the leadership of Captain Augustine huh? actually conducts um, exit interviews with those who resign from our department. I was gonna ask that, good. Yes, and so, um, and we get some feedback um, and I think in most cases, um, we think we get honest feedback um, from individuals that uh, decide to resign before uh, before the end of their term as a you know going into retirement. Sure. Um, and there's a there's a mix, right? There's some um, some resignations that we get of officers early, um, whether they're in a recruit school or in their early phases of after graduation. Mm -hmm. that we see that they'll say that the job is not what they thought it was or the job is not for them, okay? Right. Um, and, there, and, and there are some concerns about 
um, what they view as, you know, why it's not for them, right, um, from that perspective. But we also see, a, 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 I would say, a, a good majority of the officers who do leave, who are veteran officers, um, who leave for a variety of reasons. Some is because their spouse gets another job in another area. Mm -hmm. But some of it is because they are actively looking for another uh, police department um, that they think um, where communities are more accepting of, of, of law enforcement um, in those particular communities. And it's not so much about whether or not they're earning more pay. I would suggest the majority of them, they'll leave to go to other apartments. Pay is not better. They're not, they're not leaving to go to a police department generally here in the Washington metropolitan area, as an example, they're actually leaving to go to other uh, places, whether it could be Florida, it could be um, other parts of the United States um, that are maybe even in, you know, other parts of Maryland, uh, maybe not so much in a, in a, um, in a, in a region, you know, such as Baltimore or, 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 or Washington. Um, so, you know, we monitor this because again, we want that feedback that kind of gives us some some suggestions on how to address um, our officers' concerns who are thinking. I mean, I'm doing, I'm going before every executive in, I mean, I'm sorry, before every uh, officer in service training class right now to talk about uh, morale, to talk about retention, um, and really to try to encourage our officers um, from a standpoint of, you know, just understanding um, their, their um, significance um, their value um, to our communities um, to to be able to really to talk about you know understanding about retention. But at the end of the day, you know there are always going to be some officers who have other career goals in mind, um, and there are some who predict who have said, I wouldn't say a great deal of them, but there are some who have completely left the profession, um, and um, that's the disheartening part. I think when people have signed up. And, who have, and then some of those folks who have been around who are veteran officers who have literally left the profession. Um, and there are those that I've talked to who are thinking of it. Um, and, um, and so that's, that's the disturbing part, you know, particularly when we see some other numbers that start to trickle up that we haven't seen historically on this department in the past um, five to 10 years, at least. So, I hope that answers your question for in a large part about what we're actually seeing. Yeah, it, it's very helpful. It does. I'm glad to know you do the exit interviews. Um, if you document their responses, do you share those with us? I'd really love to review them and get a deeper sense of what's, I mean, in every profession, some people start and switch careers, decide right. it's not for them. In every profession, we have, you know, spouses getting other jobs in other mm -hmm. places or people that right. do warmer weather or whatever. But, um, some of the other things you raise are, you know, definitely uh, in, within our control and ought to be addressed. Um, Captain Augustine, thanks for all your good work. Um, glad to hear about the new Spanish speaking officers, remembering back to past public safety hearings. Uh, are we still having a challenge with recruitment of Asian American officers and speakers of Asian languages? Yes, that still remains a very, um, I guess, diverse problem we're having. I would say the last academy class that just graduated was the most diverse um, academy class in the history of uh, Montgomery County Police and actually make the demographics of the county. So it was great to see that, but as we moved into the current session, we didn't see as many. We had several um, uh, Asian officers go into the prior class and graduate and now are on the street from the field training program. But continuing to... Um, put the word out there, and particularly that I think our best recruitment effort to get the Asian population in law enforcement is our Asian officers talking in the community yeah. and seeing how they are successful in the police department and um, dealing with cultural issues that may not be acceptable to be police officers. So I think our best word of mouth is going through the community, yeah. and hopefully that will continue as we increase our population of uh, Asian officers on the department. Did you... Um interested in hearing your approach approach on that yet yeah, i mean have you was there any sort of notice through uh, all the like lunar new year celebrations where we just went through about the opportunities that are out there 
We haven't particularly had a specific campaign to address um, agent officers, but it's definitely something we want to um, look at. We did have a campaign for women in law enforcement. Um, right now, during Black History Month, we're having a campaign on that. So it is definitely something to look um, into the future and bring our current officers in to help um, you know, recruit and promote that through their social media networks also. Great, thanks. Can you also remind me, is there any uh, pay incentive in hiring for new officers who have specialized skills like language fluency? No, the only thing is if they do get certified through the county program, through the testing, they do get an incentive in their hourly wage, but it's nothing as as we're giving a bonus for someone to come on that has a specific skill that still has to go through the human resources process of testing and getting certified for their language level. Has that been considered? And I, I know you'd probably have to bargain or whatever, but in other plenty of professions, if you're a social worker, you know, you qualify for bonuses if you've had certain training. Um, or if you have language proficiency, I think in other of our departments, we have that. So um, wouldn't that be advantageous to be able to offer an extra $1,000 or, or $2,000 to people who are bilingual? It would be a great incentive to offer anything to um, bring someone on right now. We did have a lot of agencies out there have lateral programs where they have a $5,000 bonus if you're already a male and certified officer because you're saving that money and having to send them to the academy again. There is different types of incentives out there. We have never had a specific incentive to, for lateral officers or anything like that. It would be a great thing to have to bring on diversity and bring it forward, but we'd also have to look at the bargaining aspects of it and how that affect the sure. bargaining agreement. Yeah, I doubt, I, I doubt the union would have a problem with it. But so, um, and, and did you just say well, there's not an incentive for lateral transfers either? I thought there was. We have a step incentive. Uh -huh. Or you start at a higher step in grade, but in the end, you're still you know, coming out. So you're starting higher in the beginning. Um, so it's not a specific bonus per se as saying you're going at you know, $10,000 your first year, you get $5,000. Uh, uh -huh. year, you get twenty five hundred. It's actually just starting steps later on in there. So you're not starting the same step as a uh, rookie officer. How would we go about, I just don't know the HR process well, how would we go about creating um, a a, a, a bonus uh, for like bilingual candidates? Uh, we would have to talk to human resources as well as a, a, a general management and budget um, for fiscal aspects and then also speak with a labor to see if there's going to be any issues with uh, current officers that are already uh, working that have those skills and right. competencies. All right. I'd love to follow up with you on that. Um, I mean, we've been having this conversation for years and I'm a little surprised we don't have something like that. But if you if you think it might be effective, I'd, uh, you know, I'd love to advocate for it with the county executive whatever. Chief, I assume you might probably not oppose. You're nodding. Okay. Um, great. And then just the last thing after uh, recruitment and retention. On assignment, um, I, uh, the rule of 60 is, is interesting. Um, if the rule of 60% of officers ought to be in patrol, um, what is the, what's the thinking behind if ours is, if I'm reading this right, is ours is only 49? Well, I think that if you look at the, if you look at the chart, I think some of it is a little bit misleading okay. because if you just look at the chart that says it's the, um, I think it's around the 639 markets in patrol. What we're not including is the supervisors that are actually out on patrol. So you need to, our numbers are more in line to be um, around around 58% um, if you look at the percentage that's actually in place. Um, because you have to include our patrol sergeants are actually on our streets who actually are responding to calls um, with, with their uh, rank and file officers um, in each of our districts as well. Um, so, and we need to make sure that that's included in that uh, that that complement when we talk about our percentage. Okay. And I I apologize for that. I didn't realize that the supervisory positions were are conducting patrol as well. So right. I can modify that. Yes. Uh, sorry. So if they're included, what's the number? So the number would be closer to around seven hundred and sixty um, officers that would actually be um, on our on our in our patrol divisions. Um, um, responding as first responders. And you also, even though we lay out our DCAT teams um, and, our, and traffic will change because of our 
um, particularly because of the reorganization. But our DCAT teams, even though they are not, um, they are still first responders. Um, and so they are assigned to our district stations. They are uncontrolled, we call them uncontrolled units, but they're still in the patrol division and are still capable of handling situations such as we just talked about with carjackings, that, that we put them on these types of details that they are still marked uh, uniformed officers. Okay, thanks. And then on the comparison with Fairfax, um, uh, someone had mentioned that Fairfax starts their clock differently. So yes. differential. So how, how does that work? Why, how or why do they start it? When do they start it? Well, they start their clock when the call has been being dispatched. Our clock starts when our East, our communications um, personnel picks up the 911 call. So the minute that the phone call is picked up, we start the clock. Okay. The call has to be processed um, and, and, and before it is even dispatched, um, sent over to the dispatcher to actually send to the officer. So that's the difference in why they do that, do it that way, uh, because we'd like to provide what a complete picture looks like yeah. from a standpoint of from the time someone calls 911 to the time that we actually get to the scene. Right. Maybe I could, maybe we could guess why they do it differently. Um, we, may, we may, yes. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, that that's helpful, and I didn't want it to leave, stay out there unaddressed for the the millions listening at home. Um, sure, absolutely. You know. Um, that's all I got. Thanks again to Susan for another great packet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And, um, you know, and, and, uh, Vice President Ompernaz is going to speak in a moment, but, you know, to the, to the point that this job has always been a tough job. I don't know that it's ever been a tougher job than it is now, but it's always been a tough job. And, and we're, we never thank our public safety personnel enough. And that's never fair. And I also think it should be noted that um, Montgomery County probably has more police chiefs across the United States than any other agency. I, I mean, there's some very large agencies that, that uh, have many more personnel than Montgomery County has had over the years. But we have police chiefs, people that have uh, in, uh, developed their, their profession right here in Montgomery County, pretty much any any play, I'm, and Chief Jones, you, you know exactly what I'm saying. Pretty much every every state in the United States. I mean, there's been somebody that's got their training here. So, you know, we, we certainly have a lot. And then the, to the point about a bonus, and I'm certainly in favor of looking at everything in that comprehensive way we look at things. But if we're going to give a bonus, we can't be given a $1,000 bonus if, if another jurisdiction is given a $10,000 bonus. Heirs have to have a significance as well. We have to make certain that we are being competitive. So if we're going to do it, and I have no problem with doing it, but if we're going to do it, we need to have the background on how to do it. And with that, Council Vice President Albert Moss. Uh, just a couple follow-up points um, to the Council President. I'm all in on the property tax credit. Um, it's unquestionably a best practice to have first responders living in the communities that they serve. Um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and so I think we need to follow up on that. Um, and then just a couple of other um, issues. One is, um, I lost it, sorry, <laughs> so much going on. Um, there has also been a significant rise in hate crimes uh, across Montgomery County, um, which I know is just sort of another reason why it's important for us to stay in front of some of the challenges being faced by our community. Uh, the, the chairman and I were in a briefing recently about the hate crimes being directed to our Jewish community as an example. And I know that many in our um, religious-based organizations understandably uh, have been requesting additional support uh, to, to help them just carry forward with their faith. Uh, that's just the, the, the toxic environment that we find ourselves in right now, further stretching uh, an already pretty stretched department, um, but to address these crises, it, it, it adds to this, these challenges before us. And I also think one of the other ancillary issues that we need to take into account here is um, public relations and communications. Um, and, and I think, you know, one, one thing 
I love Pete Berenger. <laughs> so one of the things that Pete does really well uh, is, you know, because we always hear the negative stories, the tragic consequences of the interactions between law enforcement, which absolutely have to be investigated and absolutely have to be transparent. And we have to hold those accountable when we run into uh, a situation in which, you know, there's been a challenge or a problem. Um, but there are many more thousands of interactions that are positive uh, and that because of the training, because of the, the, the incredible, you know, many of the dedicated men and women didn't lead to a tragic consequence. We don't hear those stories. Uh, and we also don't have local media in the way that we once did. Um, and so, and it directly connects to retention and it directly connects to recruitment and it directly connects to the mental health of our officers. Um, and so I do think, you know, we need to look at, at, at communications within that lens. And I'm excited to hear, Chief, that so many people have applied uh, for that so vital uh, community partnership position within MCPD, because we do have to go deeper within grassroots and, and establish those authentic and meaningful relationships. But there is a role for us to play to rise above the noise and the, the extreme tension uh, and anxiousness and anxiety we're all feeling to elevate those positive stories. And, and you're exactly right, Council Member. I, I, you know, Albert Noss, I will tell you, you know, since I took over as chief, um, one of my uh, main um, talking points and one of the main directions that I gave to our department, particularly in the public information office, was to really highlight positive stories, to highlight a lot of positivity that our officers are doing. Um, yeah, and we put it out on social media. We put it out in our in our news releases. The, the, the most interesting thing to me that I see is that how, um, and I've had this conversation with many people in the media, how it's not always the shiny penny. It's not always what they want to report on. Um, and I think that hinders us to some degree. Um, but I will say that, you know, still, you know, I feel as if we're not uh, discouraged by this because we still have opportunities. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the opportunities I think we're, we're having, and I am making a change, um, I am hiring a civilian um, to lead our public information office, a change of what we've done in the past, um, and someone who has expertise in, in, the, in the field of media um, that is going to allow us to expand um, our, our, our operations that will be much more efficient mm -hmm. um, and to really highlight, to work on our social media output, to work on better media relations as well. Um, and I think this is going to be a, a, a change um, for us, a really positive change that I'm looking forward to. I'm hoping to have, I was hoping to have that person in place really um, about a month ago, a couple bumps in the road, but I think we're, gonna, we're almost there. Okay. Um, and so that should be coming in, in within the next uh, couple of months, and we'll start to revamp what our public information office looks like. Um, so I'm excited about those changes. That's good news, uh, Chief. And, and I'm also excited you're moving forward, and the county executive has approved uh, your reorganization plan, which you presented to this body several months ago, and we all concurred with it. So I'm glad to hear you. your boss is on board now. <laughs> so uh, appreciate all of you very much. Mr. Chairman, back to you. Thank you very much. And to your point about um, uh, people not knowing of all the good work, we've all attended the award ceremonies. Uh, when when you you remember hearing about the story, you know, several months prior, but you didn't know how many people actually uh, risk their lives to save somebody else's life. And candidly, I believe we should, as a just as a uh, as a usual thing, have that complete ceremony televised so that the public, I mean, we, you have the family and, and, and the people who are, you know, involved in it watching, but the, the public should be aware of what someone goes through to save someone's life, and they do it constantly. So that gets lost. So that, there again, that's another very positive thing that we should be, be doing. And with all of that, this was a very good session, but Susan, do you have anything else to add? If not, we're going to 
I don't. I'll just follow up on the items that all the committee members wanted me to. That's all. Well, it, you, we, you certainly have given us, we've given you a lot of work <laughs> to do for this public safety. We were concerned that you were, you know, at idle. We're just idle hands. So Yeah, so much for that vacation, right? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. But anyhow, thank you all very, very much for being with us. We sincerely appreciate what each and every one of you is doing, and we will work together to get ourselves to a better place. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.